the borrowers want to borrow again. And if they don't pay back, they're not going to get to borrow again. And likewise, the loan shark doesn't want to break your thumb because he wants you to borrow from him again. I'm Kevin Lang. I'm the Lawrence A. Bloom Professor of Economics at Boston University. So I've been very fortunate to have a couple of co-authors who are wonderful at, coll at collecting data. Uh, one of them, Kaiwan Leong, um, has a special history that has enabled him to get into places that many of us could not. Uh, as I tend to put it, as a young man, he had friends in low places. Um, and as he got older and more mature, even though he was a PhD economist, he was also very interested in social work. And he did work uh, with victims of loan sharking. Uh, so he knew people who worked with, um, with the victims. Uh, and he also knew people who were uh, regular borrowers and in some cases had personal connections to loan sharks. So he was able to talk to people from the milieu. He was able to hire people who either had been loan sharks or who had borrowed from loan sharks in the past or had worked with victims, um, all of whom knew their way around in such a way that when they went to talk to the borrowers, they would have credibility. They, you know, If I were to walk in and say, can I interview you about your experience in that loan? Uh, they would probably look at me and say, no, thank you. Uh, but he hired a set of people and uh, got people to talk to them. There's a certain contract that, which is sort of standard. Um, when you initially take the loan, you a standard loan would, let's say, be $100 for five weeks. Um, and then you would get what's called a $100 loan, but you would actually uh, pay a sixth of the loan right away. So it wasn't really a loan. Should have chosen an easy number, $120. So you would actually only get a $100 loan. And then you would pay back $20 a week uh, for the next five weeks. If at any point you fail to make the payment, you basically get everything that you paid, not the initial 20, but everything you've paid after that, uh, returned to you. And you get a new loan of 120 minus 20. Um, and then pay it back again in five new $20 loans. So the interest rate varies a little bit because it's done in a way that's very easy for everyone to understand, but it's a very high interest rate. The principal consequence of failing to repay one time um, is that you just have the new loan and the interest is accumulating for you. Um, you know, and as long as you never fall behind by more than a week, the consequences are, are relatively minor. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we really learned about the loan sharking business, which, which is that it's based on relationships. And uh, from movies and books, I always thought that, well, what happens if you get involved in, with a loan shark is you don't pay them back, they threaten to break your thumb. Uh, that's not what we heard. Uh, what we heard is, yeah, you get some reminders, you know, you might get some harassing phone calls, uh, but most of what goes on is, is pretty modest. Now, if, if you start getting too far behind, things get, get more serious. Um, this, our data from Singapore, and as a consequence, you know, loss of face is very important. And so they will do things that either cause the risk of loss of face so that maybe they'll shout at you on the street and maybe some of the people who are on the street will know who you are, so you might lose face. A uh, more extreme thing will actually be to go to where you work um, and make it clear to everyone, including your boss, that you haven't been repaying your loans or maybe even calling your, your parents and telling them, did you know that your child you know, doesn't pay back the money that he owes. Uh, and there is more extreme stuff. They might uh, glue your lock so you can't open it, or they might uh, you know, splash red paint uh, on your house. Uh, but you know, we actually did not hear cases of uh, 
actual physical violence. Um, and most of the more extreme stuff is, is quite rare. The enforcement really comes from the fact that the borrowers want to borrow again. And if they don't pay back, they're not going to get to borrow again. And uh, it's hard to find another loan shark uh, who will lend to you. It's not impossible by any means, but uh, you want to maintain that relationship. And likewise, the loan shark doesn't want to break your thumb because he wants you to borrow from him again. Uh, so it's very much uh, a real, what we call a relational contract. In a relational contract, both sides have some power, right? There, there is the ability not to go back to this loan shark, to find another loan shark who will lend to you if you feel you've been mistreated by the loan shark. Uh, ultimately, uh, you're almost always going to pay back. Uh, and so in that sense, there is a power dynamic that favors the loan shark. You may end up paying back by working for the loan shark. Um, we don't ask about whether they engaged in any illegal activities because that would be a violation of uh, IRB restrictions. But we can assume that some of the time that they end up working for the loan shark to repay the loan, they're actually uh, engaging in illegal activity, allowing their, their IDs to be used uh, in illegal activity or, or things like that. In Singapore, we saw that there was a crackdown on, uh, on loan sharking so that it became more dangerous to become a loan shark. And what economics tells us should happen did happen. You know, people, fewer loan sharks were available. Uh, people moved either to safer places, left Singapore, um, or got out of the business altogether. So they're, they're, there's less supply, uh, price goes up, quantity goes down, uh, and very much saw that. Uh, strikingly, there was not a clear effect on the kind of extrajudicial uh, enforcement uh, that we saw. There was, it seemed like there was more of certain types of harassment and less of other types. Uh, but what mostly happened was the interest rate went up. It went up significantly. The size of the loans got smaller. But because the interest rate went up and the loan was smaller, they had a harder time paying it back. And so ultimately, the loans were almost as costly as they had been before, even though they were getting uh, less money in, in, in the initial loan. So one of the things we see as a result of this crackdown is that people are more likely to go to borrow from friends and family to pay back because they're paying back a higher interest rate. They're struggling more to pay back. Um, so we see more of them missing a payment at some point and sort of not repaying in fully on time. We see more of them seeking out lo loans from friends, friends and family. Um, we actually know that ultimately they do pay back Right? So they pay back either by you know, actually saving, uh, not spending as much, uh, selling off property that they have, uh, or finding friends and families who, who, who will bail them out. Now, what we can't tell from our survey is to what extent the friends and families benefit or are hurt by the crackdown, because after all, we're seeing fewer loans. Conditional on there being a loan, we're seeing it more likely that they will go to friends and families to, to bail them out. Uh, we can't really tell whether in the end that's better or worse for the friends and families who are being affected by this relationship between the loan shark and, and the borrower. I started off, I think, with the Hollywood image of you know the poor single mother who, whose child gets sick, either they can't work for a while, so they don't have income, they need some short-term income, short -term. or maybe there's some expensive medication that they, they aren't insured for, and so they need some money for that. That's incredibly rare. It may be special to Singapore because there are emergency funds that are available in situations like that, but I think not. If you look at the rest of the literature, that really isn't the victim uh, of loan sharking. The people who borrow from loan sharks are people who have uh, some kind of habit uh, 
that uh, leads them into needing money. Gambling in Singapore is a big one. Um, illegal drug use is to some extent important. Uh, uh, borrowing money to pay for sex is, is not unusual. Um, what struck me was that even these people who were really quite desperate for money, they were very willing to accept money from us in order to be interviewed, right? and we weren't paying a lot, said that if they had a big windfall, right? so maybe they're, they're, they're often gamblers, so you know, maybe a, a long shot horse comes in and they get a big windfall, you know, my reaction would be, well, this is great. They'd say, okay, I can go pay off the loan shark. And we asked them, what would they do? And they'd say, well, I treat my friends uh, to a lavish dinner or, or something like that. Um, so that to me was very surprising. I, I, again, I thought of these people sort of being trapped, wanting to get out of this relationship. And instead, it's, it's very much, you know, an expectation. Um, if we ask them, you know, under what circumstances were you borrowing, uh, many of them will say, oh, it's just normal circumstances. And then when you push a little further, oh, yes, well, I was in the middle of gambling or I was in the middle of drinking. Um, and so, you know, their concept of normal is different from my concept of normal. And I don't want to be judgmental. I just want to say it wasn't the story I expected to hear. I, I think there's sort of two different uh, areas that, that we need to go. One, one is just more confirmation for other countries. We have good reason to think that what we observed is very typical of a large uh, segment of Asia. The same uh, groups that are involved in this are involved in China and Indonesia, Vietnam, and, and places like that. So I think we're, you know, that's a big part of the world. Um, so we think it, it generalizes to a great extent. We also have some evidence that the same sort of groups were operating uh, in, in the Netherlands, the journalistic descriptions that we have for the U.S. seem similar, but it would be great for somebody to get that kind of access to data for loan sharks or, or borrowers from loan sharks uh, in the U.S. to make sure that we're talking about uh, something that is a worldwide phenomenon as opposed to a more uh, Asian phenomenon. The other direction that I think would be very interesting is what we what I, I talked about earlier, which is, you know, what is the effect on friends and family, right? So the, the borrowers enter into this with a good deal of knowledge, uh, perhaps with over-optimistic expectations about repaying, but it's not clear that they actually do, that they are over-optimistic. But there are other people who get brought into this who are not parties to the agreement, and as I said, friends and family. Uh, who end up bailing out uh, the borrowers. And you know, looking at the impact on, on those people, I think, would be uh, extremely interesting. But you have to gain trust of people who are very nervous, right? They, they don't want to be seen as doing anything that will damage their relationship with the lender. Um, it's also, uh, at least in our setting, uh, not really socially acceptable to be borrowing from the loan sharks, and so they're worried about that being public, becoming public information. So you really have to gain trust. Uh, we did that in part by having already you know, published research on other activities where you have to gain trust, where we we had uh, collected data from sex workers on on their transactions, um, but it was also a critical to be able to make contact with a set of people who really understood the milieu right, and have the capacity to simultaneously oversee them and make sure that they are being honest in their dealings with us, uh, but also to have people who can approach borrowers, as I said, and feel that there's going to be an interaction that people understand when somebody says, you know, I, I, this was normal, I was gambling and I needed more money, who are going to be able to say, yeah, I understand, you know, I've been gambling and needed more money too. Um, and so that we can talk about all these things in, in a way that feels non-judgmental.